Good morning, traders. Thank you for joining us on this WTV special on putting your mind over the market. I'm Jared Levy, Chief Options Strategist here on Wise Trade TV, and using psychology in today's market is not an easy thing to master. It takes a lot of discipline and skill to become a consistent and successful trader. Here to talk to you about what you need to do in order to put your mind over the market is Mark Douglas. Mark has been a successful trader since the 80s and has written two books on trading psychology, both trading in the zone and the disciplined trader. You've heard me talk about them many times here on WTV, and he is here today to help you become successful traders. Mark, good morning. <laughs> How's it going? Good morning, Jared. Glad to be here, and I hope I can be of assistance to uh, some of your traders who are viewing right now. Mark, you know, last time we were together was at Wise Fest and mm -hmm. uh, had a lot of fun. I'm, I'm really excited that you're here with me today. Thanks. So, well, let's get started. First of all, you know, one of the things, one of the main things, one of the main issues that I see all the time is that people don't use their method to its full potential. In other words, there's a negative correlation between where the, what the trader ends up with and what he could have had if he just followed his methodology. Right. Uh, in your DVD program, you refer to this as the profit gap. This is a problem. You refer to it as the profit gap. And I think it's one of the least understood concepts of trading. Can you address this a little bit? This profit gap? Yeah, that's actually a really good place to start because, because I think that more than anything, what your viewers want or what your customers want are consistent results. They want to be able to produce an income that, you know, that they can rely on from their trading. And I'm sure that, that you know, many of your viewers have already realized that that's, getting a steady income is not such an easy task. Yeah, and everyone seems to get trapped thinking that because trading is easy. Right. Or because it's easy to find yourself in a winning trade, exactly. which many people do. Right. You know, that they think it's also easy to become a consistent winner. Right. And, and, and you know, it, it took a long time before it actually dawned on me that winning and being a consistent winner are two completely different animals, two different things. And in some ways, there isn't even a relationship between the two. It almost seems like there's no relationship between the two. Yeah. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a real hard mental barrier to break through. Mainly because, you know, we, we, it's so easy to find yourself in a winning trade and that... And that it, because winning actually requires no skill at all. In other words, unless you unless you consider that you know the being able to click a mouse button or you know tap a pad is a skill, right. and and we don't have to have a reason or good reason or even actually any reason to put your cursor on the buy or sell button and then immediately find ourselves in a winning trade. And it could be a monster of a winning trade. And what did it take? What 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 kind of uh, you know what what kind of skills did it take to actually experience this? Absolutely not. Yeah. So, so it would be natural to take the leap from, well, if it's this easy to win, it can't be that much harder to make a steady income. Like you said, it's, it's that easy to click the mouse for me to sit there and make five or $10,000, and it must be pretty darn easy for me to sit there and make right. a living out of this. You know, and that's what I thought for a long time, but that is not the case. No, no, and that's exactly how I started out too. And I know, I, unlike not unlike a lot of other people who who are willing to let's say give up a real high-paying career to be a trader because they thought it couldn't be that hard. So, so what makes consistency so challenging? What's the what's the big hurdle there? Well, we're gonna obviously we're gonna get into that, but but at the most general level, I'm gonna say that it requires learning the type of skills that people just simply aren't used to learning. Mental skills. Mental skills, yeah, exactly. In other words, it requires mental skills. Most people assume that because their technical method gives them a signal get, to get into a trade, that if the method produces a high percentage of winners, it will equate to a consistent income, not taking into consideration that the proper execution of those signals requires mental skills. Give us an example of this. Well, take for an example, you know, a high school basketball player who, you know, he, he, he'll he'll go in the gym and practice throwing his free throws maybe for even two or three hours a day it wouldn't be unusual for him to be able to hit fifty in a row would it i mean yeah. is that is that that that's you not see that all the out of the realm of reality yeah. right okay so the problem is that could he even hit two in a row if the circumstances were he was in the final game of the NCAA uh, championship his team is down one point there's only a few seconds left on the clock and he was just fouled Changes everything. Yeah, under those circumstances, without the appropriate mental skills, hitting, hitting either one of those free throws is very unlikely. And regardless of how well someone could do it in practice, most people would choke. So, so really the skills you're referring to, what you're talking about, Mark, is actually staying focused on the process, staying positively focused on the process itself, in this case, of throwing the ball, in our case, obviously, of trading or following your method, right. and not being worried about blowing it, about the consequences of what could happen if this trade goes wrong. 
Exactly right. Just like what I'm going through right now. <laughs> <laughs> trying, to stay focused, yeah, trying to stay focused on the process of this presentation and not blowing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're doing fantastic. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you know, with training, we may have a technical method telling us what to do and giving us the potential to generate consistent results. But like the basketball player, without developing the appropriate mental skills, it's, it's unlikely we'll be able to do what our method or training plan is indicating, indicating without making a number of potential execution errors. In other words, to stay positively focused on the process of trading by doing exactly what we need to do, when we need to do it, without hesitation, reservation, or fear. Okay. That's interesting. So you see, no matter how good a technical method is at generating winning trades, turning those winners into a consistent income requires the ability to do or not do some things that the method itself can't help us with. For example, our method can't force us to predefine the risk of getting into a trade. Or if we do predefine the risk, our method can't force us to take the loss that ends up turning into a bigger loss. Right. And, and, you know, that's happened to everybody. Okay, Our method can't prevent us from moving a stop closer to our entry point where we get stopped out and the market trades back in our favor. Our method can't prevent us from hesitating and getting in too late. Or our method can't, can't stop us from jumping the gun and getting in too soon where the signal to actually get in never really develops. And our method can't stop us from getting out of a winning trade too soon and leave money on the table. Mm -hmm. Nor can it prevent us from letting a winning trade turn into a losing trade without having taken any profit. I know that all of our traders have experienced these issues. I, I know they have. And, and I think really what you're saying is that the methodology, and, and this methodology, folks, what we're talking about when we say the word methodology is the wise trade software, is the, is, that's our method. And it can give us winning trades. We've seen, I know all of you have had winning trades, but it cannot give us consistent results if we're susceptible to making the kind of mental errors that you're talking about right. here, okay? Exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. And all the mental errors I just listed are the result of thinking, no, I'm saying, a result of thinking, believing, or assuming that our technical method is telling us what's going to happen next on a trade-by-trade -trade basis and not understanding that technical methods aren't designed to do that. Right. Technical methods and patterns are designed to put the odds of success in our favor over a series of trades. It may not seem like it on the surface, but there's some profound psychological implications here. What this means is the outcome of the signals generated by any technical method on a trade-by-trade -trade basis are unique and random. In other words, there's no way to know in advance what the outcome to any particular signal will be or what the sequence of wins or losses will be over a series of trades. It's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I understand what you're saying. And I, I think, you know, um, we, we need to, first of all, know that many of our viewers out there are experiencing the same sort of thing, okay? Uh, and, and they're probably going to have some trouble grasping this concept that by accepting the randomness of these outcomes they can produce consistent results. That's, that's an odd concept. Yeah, that's, but that's exactly what I'm saying, Jared. I know it's somewhat of a paradox to think that events that have a random outcome can produce a consistent result, but think about it. This is the principle that's been used by casinos for hundreds of years. Right. Technical methods and patterns will give the individual trader the same kind of advantage the casino has over the individual player. If if the trader can think about it from the proper perspective. On the other hand, if a trader who has, who, 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 let's say, who has uh, generated his signal from a technical method hasn't learned to integrate this principle, this randomness principle, into his trading regimen, he'll undoubtedly find that trading can be one of the most frustrating, if not exasperating, endeavors he's ever chosen to undertake. You know, and I know there are a lot of viewers out there who may be experiencing frustration. In fact, I know there are definitely viewers who are experiencing frustration, but I'm not sure if they're making the connection that the reason because, you know, they don't believe in this randomness principle where you can generate consistent returns by looking at the outcomes of their trades as random and unique. Right. They have to be able to view that as random and unique. You know, that, that's, I think, the big issue. No, I know, and that's, that's why we're here explaining it right now. You see, the frustration comes from expecting, from our expectations. It's from expecting something from our technical method. It just can't do. Technical methods define and identify patterns in collective human behavior. Right. Now, the patterns definitely exist. They repeat themselves over and over again. The problem is 
the outcomes don't always correspond with the patterns on a trade by trade basis. So what I'm saying is that yes, we have patterns. Yes, the, the, and they and they repeat themselves over and over, and our minds just naturally think, well, I have a pattern that's consistent, I should have an outcome that's consistent with the pattern, right. and, and that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is that there doesn't have to be a relationship between the outcome and the pattern. Right. So, and if the last trade was a winner, right. this trade, even if the charts are the same, right. even if we've got the same exact signal, the same looking chart, there's no guarantee that this trade is going to be the exact same as the past one. Exactly. In other words, this trade, the trade I'm in right now, could turn out to be a winner. And and does that mean that, that the next trade is going to be a winner? Absolutely not. This trade I'm in right now could end up being a loser. And does that mean that, that the next trade is going to be a loser? No, absolutely not. Yeah. This is interesting. I mean, I, I'm trying to, for, for, for us up here, you know, the goal, the, the main goal is obviously to take these concepts and reduce them down to the most simple of terms. So, you know, let's again back up here for a second. There are traders out there using Wise Trade every right. single day. They're getting the same exact patterns, okay? But what you're saying is even though the specific criteria is being used to identify the pattern, okay, for mm -hmm. each signal, same right. criteria, same, right. same, same formula, same everything. Right. The, the chart outcomes, pattern can look exactly the same. The, the, yeah, everything. Right. The right. outcomes to each signal have no relationship to one another. That's right. That's exactly what I'm saying. That there's a random distribution between wins and losses over any sequence of trades that, that you might look at. And so, you know, uh, and, 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 and again, this is, this is a very difficult concept to grasp, but it's, it's really the traders who have, uh, who have grasped it, let's say, and, and learn how to think in what I call probabilities. Okay. They're the ones that, that don't experience the same kind of, you know, the same kind of emotional trauma that the typical trader does because they're expecting something that just, just may not happen. So, for an example, if, if this trade's a winner based on uh, this particular trade I'm in right now, based on the exact same criteria okay. that you know, or let's say I'm in a trade right now, or I'm getting into a trade right now, and the exact same, same criteria exists in the market that did the last time, I'm going to naturally expect it to be a winner if it was a winner the last time. Or I probably will naturally expect it to be a loser if it was a loser maybe the last time or, or we had two or three losers in a row. And this could be a source of frustration for traders. Oh, absolutely. In other words, if, yeah, and that's, ex and that's exactly what happens. It is a source of frustration because if I'm expecting it to be a winner and it turns out to be a loser, I'm going to be frustrated. Not only going to be frustrated, I may, I'm going to be disappointed and I may feel, even feel betrayed depending on how much, you know, how much kind of energy that I put into the idea that, this, that the trade is going to be right. Well, how do we get over that? I mean, how does a trader take, you know, okay, so I've got all the things right. I've got my charts lined up. I've done everything I was supposed to do. How does the trader at least begin to accept these sorts of things or, or you know, how do they right. begin to remedy these issues? Well, the, yeah, we kind of have to get into the nuts and bolts, the nuts and bolts of this, of, of okay. just exactly how the markets work. Because I think that one of, one of the big problems, one of the reasons why people have such a difficult time with this is because their initial exposure to the markets themselves is through electronics. Right. In other words, there, there's, through electronics, there's a, a real disconnect between what you're actually participating in and what's causing, you know, you to want to participate in the first place. In other words, you know, markets started as exchanges. Right. And there were, and, and so when you trade, you traded at an exchange, mm -hmm. so you know that all prices are people generated events. Correct. They are, and, and see, this is what people have to take into consideration. Everything happens because of what people believe. There is no, when, when you look at the nature of trading and break it down to its simplest components, what you have is everyone trying to do the same thing. There is no possible way that any of us can make money as traders unless we can buy low and sell high or sell high and buy low. Correct. Is there, is there any other way, Jared? No. No, no other in way? In every market. In every market. So basically everyone's trying to do the same thing, are they not? Yes. Everyone is doing the same things. Now the reason why we have price movement is because everyone has a different idea about what, a, what is high and what is low. Okay. Right. So now I, I expose, get exposed to a technical method. Now, what does this technical method do? And this is, and this is the relationship that people need to grasp. If they grasp this relationship, then they can grasp this idea that, that, you know, that you can take the same set of criteria and end up with random results. And it's this, it's like what people realized years ago is that you can apply, you can take data points. In other words, data points meaning what you're doing is you're you're translating the human you know the, the human behavior, the human belief in if if I'm going to buy Into something at, visual? Was that no, it doesn't have to be visual, but it's like it could be yeah, it started out being visual, it started out being chart patterns based right. on bar charts. But but what you do is is that is that if I'm if I'm going to um, 
if I'm going to buy, it's because at right now, let's say the last price is 10 and I, and I put in an order to, to buy something at 10, okay? It's because I believe that the market's going to go to 11 Correct. or it's going to go to 12. Yeah. Certainly if I thought or I believed it was going to go to 9, I would wait, would I not? Correct. So yeah. the reason why I'm buying at 10 is because that's what I believe. In other words, in other words, you know, it, all price movement is based on people's belief about what's going to happen in the future. Now, now you said to me in a conversation we had yesterday, um, obviously we as individual traders are not large enough in our accounts to move the market. Exactly. And okay. so this is, this is, yeah, this is the next connection that people have to make, is that, is that since all price movement is based on people's conviction or belief about the future, how do prices actually move? For an example, when, when you put in an order or I put in an order, I don't, I don't trade at a level where I can actually move prices. But what the typical screen-based trader doesn't understand is that there are traders, there are many, there are thousands of traders out there who do move prices, mm -hmm. and that it is their intention to move prices. Or you can have a large group of traders coming into the market and then cause prices to move. But what actually has to happen for prices to move is this, is that if the last price of something is 10, for, for the market to actually move to 11, all the offers have to be taken out, meaning right. that, or move to 12, all the offers at 11 have to be taken out. So in other words, people who are trying to sell at 11 they have to get their orders filled before it can get to 12. Okay. Well, for someone, for someone to actually bid it to 11 or bid it to 12, they are doing the exact opposite, and this is really critical. They are doing the exact opposite in that moment of what it takes to be successful. Okay. They're not buying low, they're buying high. They're okay. buying high relative to the last price. And, and or buying higher relative to the so, last So how price. does understanding this concept, how does understanding what moves the markets help our traders to take it to the next level? How does, I mean, is this the first step for them getting control and, and understanding how the well, market's working? Yeah, they, yeah they definitely have to understand. They have to understand how prices move because when they understand how prices move, then they'll understand how their technical method relates to this movement because what technical methods do, whether it's a visual pattern or, or you know, uh, moving averages or a wise, any, a wise trade or whatever, you're using mathematics mathematical formulas, okay? okay. You're agree. taking data points. In other words, you're taking what people believe about the future, transforming them or transposing them into a data point okay. as a price, a price over time, right. okay? Or with volume. Right. There's, there's any or a number, fresh cross. Yeah, the fre there's, there, 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 just, there's any number. That's what it ends up being is a fresh cross. But I'm right. talking about the actual mathematical formula that makes the fresh cross, okay. okay? So there are any number of variables that go into this equation. Now, what people have found is that, and this is here, what people have found is that using these data points into certain types of mathematical equations, you can find patterns in collective human behavior. And what these patterns mean is this, is that, is that, is that when, the, when this set of criteria okay, is present in the market, right. that there is simply a higher probability than not. In other words, there's a higher probability, or what I'm going to call an edge, a higher probability of one thing happening over another, that people, that other people are actually going to come into the market and bid it higher from here or offer it lower from here. There's just, in other words, when the pattern is present, this collective pattern is present, it will repeat itself. Sure. But the problem is, is that, is that it repeats itself on a random basis because, because even though the actual mathematical criteria is exactly correct that's or not, exactly the same. You can't, that doesn't, mathematical models can't predict human beings. That's right. right. Mathematical models can't predict who the actual individuals who are going to come into the market and actually do it. Right. In other words, it takes someone to do it. When you put on a trade, if you're not going to make your trade a winner by bidding the market, if you bought something by bidding the market, you know. Using what, all of my money. Using so, all, yeah. all of your money to, to, you know, if you bought something at 10, you could, you could actually wipe out all the offers and, and bid it to 11 or bid it to 12 or bid it to 13. Now, the price is at 13. All the trades that you put on at 10 are winners, right? Yeah, but I okay. still bought it at 11 and 12. Yeah, but well, you're averaging up. But the point is, all the trades that you put on were winners. You actually made yourself a winner. That's correct. But what I'm saying is that when you don't trade at that level, you, we are actually obliged to other traders to come in to buy something at a worse price than, that we, than what we thought was low to make us winners. So what you're saying is most of us out there are dependent upon someone else exactly. to move the market for us. We're trying to identify that pattern, obviously, using the wise trade software. Right. To find those common entries, but again, it's a random event. Well, but we're, yeah, we're putting the edge you yeah, said in our favor, yeah. Jared. When you put on a trade, okay. When you put on a trade, do you know who? Now, now, what we've done, we, we've reduced the market down to these terms, okay. Mm -hmm. That it takes someone else to make us a winner, right? Correct. Okay. When you put on a trade, do you think about who that might be? Who might come into the market to actually make you a winner? No, of course not. Yeah, no. And and if it turns out to be a winning trade, do you know who that who those traders were or who that trader was that actually made you a winner? No. 
Is there any way to know? <laughs> no. There might be, but it'd be pretty hard to find out, right? I mean, you could you, you make could a go, few phone you, calls. You could go, yeah, well, you can go to the you can go to the, the, the clearing firm, you know, the firm that clears the, or the you know, the, the bottom line is you bottom can. line, yeah, exactly. So what I'm saying is that is that when when you're when you're when the pattern presents itself, like okay, I have an edge here. When the pattern presents itself, we don't have any idea about of who is actually going to come into the market to do this for us. And so there's no point in analyzing. There's no point in judging. There's there's no point in in you know in trying to figure out whether it's going to work or not. It would be like, for an example, if I said to you, Jared, I'm going to give you a coin, and this coin is weighted in a way where it's going to come up head 70% of the time. Right. Now. Just because it, just because I know, I know mathematically and statistically that this pattern of coming up head 70% of the time exists, do, is there still any way for me to know the actual sequence to heads, to heads to tails? Of course not. It's an infinite. Well, no, I'm I saying, mean, do, well, I, do I know the sequence? In other words, I'm going to flip the coin 100 times, and statistically it's going to come up head 70% of the times. I still don't know which, which flips gonna are going to come up heads. Which are yeah, which flips heads. are going to come up heads. They say which flips. It's not the times. Right. Which ones? In other words, which, you know, we flip the coin once, it comes up heads. Flip the coin twice, it comes up heads. The next one's tails, the next one's tails, the next one's tails. In other words, we could have streaks of heads or tails, okay? Yeah. We, could have, we could have streaks in there. The point that I'm making is that there's no way to know the actual sequence. But at the end of the day, we know we have 70%. 70 so what that does, that, 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 that obligates us, if we want to be able to trade our methodology in, in, in an effective fashion, to be able to utilize this methodology in a way where we can extract the maximum amount of profit that it, that it makes available to us based on the pattern that it identifies, we, we, have, to, we have to do it in certain ways. In other words, we, we have to, our mind has to be free to be able to execute these trades without making trading errors. And the trading errors come from believing, believing that that the, because the pattern is present, that it's going to give me a winning trade on this one. This trade is going to be a winner. You can't think that way. No, you can't think that you way. You can't think that That's way. the way the typical trader thinks. Right. The typical trader thinks, I'm not going to put this trade on unless I think it's going to be a winner. Or why would I do it? So and, the, so and, 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 and it skews our expectations. See, it messes our expectations. Well, let's up. back up a couple seconds here. I, there's some great stuff here, Mark, and I hope our traders are getting all of this. You're, you're basically saying, and this makes a whole lot of sense to me, and I hope it's getting through to you guys, we have a tool that gives us an edge, whatever it is. Right. What, even if that edge is 2% or 3%, I, I don't know if we can... No, it's one more, it's more than that. Maybe more than that. What do you mean more than that? It's a lot more than that. It's, it's far more than 50%. Well, I was saying greater than 50. Okay. I was using okay. edge oh, as defined yeah. oh, as... Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, okay. So maybe 55 or 56% yeah, okay. yeah, of the time. Right. Let's just say... And the a, thing is, it doesn't even have to be 50% to actually make consistent money. That's what people can realize, too. That depending on, on what, the, what the ratio is between what you have to risk to find out if a trade is going to work and how much profit it generates when it does, you don't even need a 50% win-loss ratio. Right. I, as a matter of fact, I back in the 80s, there are, you know, uh, one of the most famous traders from the 80s, uh, Richard Dennis, on a percentage basis, 95% of his trades were losers. 95%. But the 5% that were winners were monsters. And he was able to take, he was able to put on trades at a, at a 95% loss ratio and make, in, in, at the most, at one point, in, I think around 1987 or 1988, now, he had $400 million. Is that using his edge? Or his money management, or a combination, a combination of both of all of it. Okay. Com and see, one of the things he did too, and, th and this is some something I, I ought to really qualify with. He would use orders to actually probe the market. See, there's w one of the things you, you, I want. I don't want to leave what we're doing right now, but I'm going to just kind of divert just for a moment, okay. and so that people understand that 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 one of the first things to be a successful trader that you have to learn, other than the fact of, of finding a good edge, meaning something that puts a pattern, a collective pattern that that your that your edge identifies that. Puts puts the odds in your favor, right. that there's a higher probability of one thing happening over another once this pattern is present in the market, is that you have to learn how to think in probabilities. In other words, you have to get your expectations you know, aligned with the way the, act, the market actually exists. Right. And, and when you do, in other words, when you, when you learn these kind of mental skills and you're able to execute your trades without, without fear and without hesitation, without analyzing or even without thinking for that matter, because you don't need to think. I'll give you an example. A professional trader. What, what a professional trader thinks about when, when there's an edge present is, uh, does he think about whether the edge is going to work? Absolutely not. Because he, he knows he has learned there's no point. Right. There's no point in, in, in analyzing or judging or, or, you know, uh, uh, or, or building a case for or against whether that trade is going to work. Because he understands the human component, okay? Right. 
But what he does think about is he thinks about the risk. How much do I have to risk? How far am I going to let the market go against this position to tell me that other traders are either going to come into the market and make me a winner or not? And he also has a plan for how he's going to take profits. Right. But the typical trader, what does the typical trader do? They, they don't have a plan. Or, well, yeah, or, or, or they think they about the trade too much. They think about, is this going to be a winner? Is this going to be That's a loser right. for me? The exact opposite of the professional. So, so what the professional does is basically... And then, and then once they make up their mind that it's a winning trade, they don't, they don't predefine their risk, do they? Right. And they also don't have a plan to take profits because they think, when they think it's going to be a winner. Trade, it, it, it's going to go on. And, and I want to talk about right. that. We're running up on the break here, but I want to talk about that on the other side. But what you're saying is the bottom line is the professional sees the entry. He sees the pattern, whatever it is, the edge, enters in, not thinking if I'm going to win or I'm going to lose, but has a money management strategy in place, knows exactly how much he wants to win or is willing to win and how much he's willing to lose or risk. Right. Exactly. Now, does, he, does he put a cap on the upside? Does he put a cap on his win well, side? Well, it's, it's not a matter a of a goal. cap. It's a matter of, of, of how, his assessment of how much potential there is. Okay. In other words, it, see, the problem is on a winning trade, we're, 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 we're obligated in a sense to, to make these never-ending decisions as to you know, what the risk-to-reward ratio is. In other words, as the market's going in my favor, what's the risk of finding out that it's going to go further? And that's why, you know, that's why so many professional traders or people who teach trading advocate scaling out of positions. Right. Mark, this is all great stuff. We're going to have to wind it up. We've got to go to a break. Guys, it's already time. As I said, for a break. We'll be back with much more with Mark Douglas here in three minutes. We'll see you soon here on WTV. Welcome back to the WTV special on putting your mind over the market. I'm Jared Levy. Mark Douglas has been talking about psychology in today's market. Mark, let's continue with our conversation we left off with. We were talking uh, when we left about the flip of a coin. Right. And you said that you had a coin that was actually weighted on one side. You gave an example how a coin was weighted on one side. And over a series of flips, that coin had a 70% chance of, in this case, landing on heads. Right. Whereas in our software, we give you the edge and maybe with our software, you have a better chance of being right or having a winning trade if you get in on a certain pattern. Right. You also talked about how... Um, it's the word right that's, that's really critical here, okay? Right. And, you know, <laughs> it's the word right. In other words, in other words what, what, what people need to understand is that, is that is how does believing in a random result affect your expectations because see what what we don't want is we don't want to get into trading with the possibility of being disappointed or the possibility of being dissatisfied or, or being even betrayed because a lot of traders feel that way they really mm -hmm. feel betrayed and the problem is is that when that potential exists it it has the effect of of affecting the way that we see market information in detrimental ways because in other words we all of us have these mental pain avoidance mechanisms that affect our perception of information right. so for an example if the markets if I'm in a losing trade and uh, you know and and I and I you know I got into this trade thinking I was going to be right Okay. In other words, I did all my evaluation, I did all my analysis, I did my work, I built a case. Right. You know, it's like as the markets as the markets, you know, moving against me, I'm going to have the tendency to focus on information that tells me that I'm right and ignore the information that tells me that the market is actually trending against me. Okay. In other words, I can I can identify a trend, but I won't be able to identify that trend if I'm putting an inordinate amount of significance on the information that's telling me that I'm right, as opposed to ignoring the information that's telling me that I'm wrong. And see, and overall, if we want to be consistent, the principle that we need to, to keep in mind is that to be consistent, we have to cut our losses and let our profits run. We have to make more on our winning trades than what we lose on our losing trades. And the problem is, is that if I'm susceptible to being disappointed or betrayed, meaning I get into a trade, you know, expecting it to do what I think it's going to do, that, that I'm going to have this tendency to, to uh, distort market information that causes me to hang on to my losers. And in a winning trade, what will happen is that instead of letting a winner run, you know, markets don't go straight up. In other words, if I'm in a, in a, in a, in a, in a uh, long trade, right. you know, I would like the market to go straight up, but they don't. They go up and they come back and they come. And, and it's the retracements we focus on instead of the fact that the market's still trending in our favor. So what you're saying right now, basically, is I found a stock, for instance, that I love. The stock right. just had a great news story. The charts are the same as the other stocks I've traded, but just for some particular reason, I feel great about this stock. Mm -hmm. Don't know what it is, but maybe they've had some great news out, and I feel that stock starts to go against me. 
you know what? Based on the news that's out there, based on the special feeling I have about this stock, I continue to hold my loser. I continue to hold my loser until this thing draws down against me and I'm in a, and I'm in a major losing position. And I keep losing because I feel in my mind that I had some sort of special, th this stock was special. Is that what you're, you're referring well, to? Or? Not, well, yeah, I could, it could be anything. Because I know it, traders it, do that. Yeah, I know. I, it, it, it could be any, any, any variable kind of information that, that people latch on to. Okay. The, the thing that they have to understand is regardless of the reason that they got into a trade, it doesn't, regardless of the reason, if other traders don't buy into that reason, or if other traders don't have, a, have another reason to want to buy at a price that's worse than yours. You bought the stock at 10. Yes. Someone's got to want to buy it at 11. Someone's going to want to buy it at 12 and buy it at 13. And not only be able to buy it at 11, 12, and 13, and 14, they're going to have to take out all the offers, all the traders who think it's high, in other words, at 11, 12, and 13. And so if, if these people aren't coming into the market to do that, well, then whatever reason you thought you had might not be so good. Right. And so that's why it's so critical to predefine your risk before you even get into a trade. And that's why professional traders don't think about it any other way because they know it takes other people. That, that you know, our, my reason might be great, but if someone else isn't buying into it, what difference it does it make? Matter. It doesn't matter because it's not a winning trade. And so, you know, and so if we have this susceptibility to, to be disappointed, it, what it does, it, it, it affects our perception of market information in a way that doesn't allow us to so cut our losses. how do we make ourselves not susceptible? I mean, how, how can you by shut changing, off? Yes, by changing your perspective on this, by really understanding. For an example, Jared, you ever played a slot machine? Yes. Okay. Now, I don't like it, you know, you might, okay. <laughs> but I played you, it. You, you, uh, whatever reason you don't like it, it doesn't matter, okay? It, that's good that you didn't like it because it might make the example even better, okay? <laughs> okay, you play a slot machine. Mm -hmm. When, uh, when you, you put your money in the machine, let's say it was a quarter machine, okay? Mm -hmm. You put your in the money in the machine, you press the button, and the pattern indicating that there's a payoff doesn't show up. How do you feel? No. Well, yeah. do you feel betrayed? Do no. people betrayed by the machine? No, no, not okay. at all. <laughs> and why do you not feel betrayed by the machine? It's just a random, it's just... Oh, it's a <laughs> random outcome. Okay. So, so in other words, you went into it with the belief that you know that you're participating in an event with a random outcome. Right. And as a result, your expectations about the outcome were in, were in perfect alignment with the event itself. My expectation, believe it or not, was to lose. I, I know this sounds crazy, but I, you know, when I put the quarter in, mm -hmm. I thought... You know what? I'm probably going to lose this quarter. <laughs> yeah, or exactly. Okay, because that's because you know the odds aren't exactly in your favor, and 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 what trading systems can do is actually put the odds in your favor in a way where where we own the machine. Believe it or not, I mean this is this is it, it, the whole role reverses if you learn to think about it correctly. In other words, if you understand that you know. So so for an example, well, let me backtrack a little bit and say that say that that most traders. You know, if, if you compare trading to a slot machine, the difference would be that with a slot machine, we can't play until we've accepted the risk. In other words, we actually have to put our, take our money out of our pocket and put it in the machine or otherwise we can't play. Right. So, that, so that implies that we've accepted the risk because the degree to which we have not accepted the risk, we wouldn't be able to put our money in that the machine. That is our loss. The quarter is our loss. That's the risk. No, that's not our loss. That's just the risk. The risk. That's just how much okay. we're willing to invest to find out if it's going to work. Okay? Okay. And then what we do is we wait for a pattern to show up. And if the pattern's, uh, you know, a jackpot, great. If it's not, then we, we might be willing to put another quarter in the machine to find out if it is. The difference with trading, and this is where, where people's, people's mental idea of, of what this is all about gets, gets messed up. The difference with trading is that the pattern shows up in the market. First. The pattern shows up first, okay? Then what we have to do is put up our money, hmm. meaning, meaning how much am I willing to risk to find out if it's going to work, but... <laughs> Most traders, because they evaluate, because they judge, and because they analyze, they think that and build a case for the pattern being right, they actually talk themselves out of believing that the risk even exists. They might give lip service to the idea of putting, into, putting a stop in the market, like, like some of those errors that I said in the beginning. Right. How many people put stops in the market and take them out and then, you know, and then let what would have been a, a small losing trade go into a big losing trade? That's lip service. You see, that's, that, well, okay, I've been told over and over again I've got to put stops in the market, so I'm going to do it. But they haven't really accepted the risk. Right. They see they it every day. Yeah, every day. Yeah, 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 they haven't really, truly accepted the risk because they don't want to be wrong.
And what they have to understand is that this is not a right or wrong game. This has nothing to do. Trading a technical methodology or a technical pattern does not have anything to do with being right or wrong. It's just, a, it's just an odds game. That's all it is. In other words, you get an edge, an edge that says I've got the odds in my favor over a series of trades, but you've got to be able to take every single trade because you don't know the sequence to wins and losses. you got to be able to, to identify what your risk is, and that's simply how much am I willing to spend to find out if other traders are going to come into this market and bid it higher than my price or offer it lower than my price if I sold. That's all it means. And then, of course, you have to have a money management plan for how to take consistent profits. Right. Which, and, and is, see another, which thing, is another problem I want to say. Oh, yeah. But see, the thing is, it's like when you change your perspective, when you change how you think about this, okay, it's like, it's like I know there's a random outcome to these patterns. And so I know it's not right or wrong. And so what potential do I have to get disappointed? No more potential than what you had to get disappointed by putting a quarter in a slot machine and it didn't come up with a jackpot. Right. You see, that's, this is the critical but, thing here, Jared. You've got to be able to change the way you think. This is the, 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 what's the title of this program? Mind, mind over market. markets? Okay. <laughs> You've got to be able to change the way you think. And how, how does a trader do I mean, what are the steps? I mean, you know, tell is there is there a, a, obviously by, by reading your books, by getting themselves immersed in your thinking is certainly a way to do that. Is there anything from this point forward a trader can begin to do or thoughts that traders can you know, try to add to the repertoire to, to begin to think like a professional trader, have that carefree state of mind, and start to change the way that they view the markets and their risk? Is there is there an exercise? That yeah, can... there's well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's 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 an exercise in trading in the zone, exercises in in how to think like a professional trader, and and basically all it really takes, Jared, is, is simply a sincere willingness to do it. Honest to God, it's just you know it's just like anything else in our lives. When when we realize that there's that there's a particular goal that we have. And, you know, and, and there's a strong desire to achieve that goal, then we're going to take whatever steps we need to achieve it. What, whether those steps are trading in the zone or, or, or how to think like a professional trader or some other methodology that people are more comfortable with or, or whatever, the point is, is, that, is that if someone really, you know, really sets their mind, any of us, when we really set our mind at getting something, we'll, we'll get there. We, we will get there, but the, but the difference is, like we started out in the beginning of the program, the difference with this is that, is that what we have to set our mind at is how to change our mind, hmm. okay? And, and, and that's, why there's, that's why there's so many people who, who are so close to getting it, but never really, never really get beyond that What's threshold. What's that hurdle? What, why can't... Because people don't want to change the way they think. It's that simple. People don't like changing. How can people get to the carefree state of mind that you talk about? By changing the way that they think. They've, they've, got to, they've, they've got to eliminate the potential to think that the market's going to disappoint them. They've got to eliminate the potential to think that the market's going to disappoint them. And the way they eliminate that poten the potential is by understanding that trading is not about being right or wrong. It's a probability game. Right. If and you're trading technically. Now, I don't want to confuse people, but I've got to say something else, is that is that traders do evolve. you got evolve. an hour and a half, by the way. Keep we going. We do? Oh, okay. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got that long, honestly, God. <laughs> Go ahead. I'll oh, my. Right <laughs> no, is, is that there are, there are stages of development. In other words, and, and I think I started to talk about this in the last segment, is that there are stages of development, that, that we start out learning these fundamental skills, like learning how to think in probability so that the market doesn't have this potential to cause us to feel emotional pain. Right. We did everything we could. We had our edge. It didn't work out. That's right. On. And that's all that it is. When you put on a trade and it doesn't work, all it really, all it really means, all it really means is this, is that, is that some other traders didn't come into the market that had the same belief that you had or the same conviction that you had about this market doing whatever it is that you thought it was going to do. That's all it is. It's nothing more than that. And you have to learn to walk away. And you have to learn to walk away. I mean, let's put it this way. How, how good do you think the average person is at, at predicting other people's behavior? In someone else's behavior. Not, people aren't that good at predicting other people's behavior. Especially or even their own behavior, for that matter. Okay? <laughs> yeah, exactly. They find themselves doing things that, what, what am I doing this for? You know? and, and so how good are they going to be at predicting collective human behavior? Now, these, the methodologies... That, that, that we have access to, these mathematical formulas, do that for us. Right. If you, but you have to understand that, that there's no possible way that these mathematical formulas can predict, can predict the outcome of, of, of these patterns on a trade-by-trade -trade basis, only on a series of trades. 
In other words, what they're really saying is that I have the odds. So, so when I get a signal, when I get a signal from my methodology, at the very fundamental, most fundamental level, what this is telling me right. is that fresh cross is that fresh cross. <laughs> I have there's a higher prob there's there's a, there's a high or let's say I there's there's the uh, the odds are in my favor. The odds are in my favor that somebody that somebody is going to come into the market. This is what the pattern means. Right. The odds are in my favor that somebody is going to come into the market and bid it higher from here if I bought or offer it lower from here if I sold. That's, that's all it's saying. Now, they're either going to come or they're not. And so, as a result, I don't look at this as being a right or wrong. I look at this as how, how much distance am I going to give the market to move away from my entry point to tell me that, that they're either going to come or they're not, and any further is not worth the money of finding out. It's not worth the cost of finding out. Do you that, talk that's about, all it means. Do you talk about stop losses? Um, you, you talk about stop losses and management in, in your in your DVD. Yeah, absolutely, but not in, but not like uh, very specific. Not yeah. not 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 the kind of specifics that you know, like like if you're using if you're in a half an hour uh, time frame, you know how much. Well, how well, that's much the trader's decision. To, yeah, but it, 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 the trader, dependent upon their trade style, is going to adjust their stops according to their account size, according to the exactly. risk tolerance, etc. Right. What you do, I think, is give people an understanding and a basis of of where they should be placing their risk or how much, not from a dollar perspective, but maybe from a... Uh... From a men yeah, in other words, it, you know, in, in, so, that, so that they can, yes, you're, from a mental perspective, so that they can adjust their trading style in a way that, that conforms to where they're at in terms of their, their, their ability to, to, to take the risk. Would, would one exercise be for a trader to begin testing out their loss? In other words, take a $100 loss, see how you feel. If you were able to take a hundred dollar loss and walk away and not fret too much about it, not let it stress out your the rest of your trading day and not think about it, maybe then you could say, okay, I'm willing to trade a more volatile stock and move to something like a two hundred or three hundred dollar loss, etc. Is that an exercise you think would be beneficial? Oh, absolutely. For the yeah, absolutely. I mean, in other, and that's what I suggest to people, you know, all the time. Especially, you know, I was doing coaching. It's like, and 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 when I was when I was doing coaching on an active basis, I mean, I was coaching some some pretty pretty substantial money managers and you know they'd get into a, a situation where they're on a you know a, a pretty good losing streak and often it required that they actually go back to a risk level that you know they hadn't meaning that if they were trading you know ten thousand or a hundred thousand shares or willing to take you know a half a million dollars or a million dollar hit on a trade you know to get back to where they they felt more in sync with the market that they may had to go they may have had to go back to only trading a thousand shares and see, and, and when you're working in a in a in a corporate situation like that, you know, with other traders, that's often a hard thing to do. But that's exactly what they needed to do. I, I suggest to people that that I mean, look at it this way: um, paper trading. Okay, paper, a lot of a lot of people who teach trading say that you know there's no point in in someone paper trading because there's there's oftentimes a huge difference between the results they'll experience paper trading. And, and what they'll experience when their real money is on money. the line. Yeah, because there's no real money on the line. In other words, in other words, I'm sure there are probably a substantial number of viewers out there who can make consistent money, consistent money, following their methodology, <laughs> paper trading, and then they, then they start doing real trading, and everything changes, okay? Well, and so a lot of teachers have said, well, there's no point in paper trading because, you know, there, there's, there's no correlation between the results. Well, that's not really true because what, what, paper trading, what paper trading can do for people is very, very beneficial. One, it, it's a graphic demonstration, graphic demonstration of the gap that exists in terms of mental skills that they need to acquire. In other words, hmm. in other words, it, it, it's a good way to get familiarized, familiarize yourself with your trading platform. It's a good way to really get confident with your methodology. But more so, it is a graphic representation of the mental skills that you don't have. That you don't. That's have. an interesting concept. Yeah. So, in other words, how does people, how does someone convince themselves that they need those mental skills? Look at your paper trading. Uh, look at your paper trading in relationship to your real trading. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if, if there's, and, and a lot of this, even if people have learned to think in probabilities, which is what we've been talking about pretty, pretty much this whole time, even if people learn to think in probabilities, it doesn't mean that they can really still accept the loss. Right. Because, because, because the way our minds think, in other words, in other words, if, if, I'm, if I have to take a loss on this trade, right. it could have the tendency to tap me into all the accumulative kind of negative pain of every time I've had to take a loss in my life. 
and it just doesn't mean in trading. It could mean, you know, yeah, pets or what, you know, people and, and that sort of thing, or jobs. And so, because our minds have this tendency to associate, it, it, it can make it difficult to accept the loss. So a lot of times what people would have to do, and, and they also would find difficult to do because a lot of times people get into trading because they want to impress their friends or their family like I'm a trader. Right. But that what they might have to do is that is that when they graduate from paper trading, they might just, you know, the, the amount of risk tolerance they have might only be just 10 shares and risking a buck on those 10 shares. And you think, well, what's the point of that? Well, the point of that is that, you know, when you can trade those 10 shares flawlessly based on whatever your methodology says right. and do it without any fear or Because you were able to make those trades in the paper. I mean, you right. made those trades it, in the paper. Then you, trade. then, you can go to, then you can go to 20 shares and yeah. see how that feels. Then you go to 30 and gradually work your way up. And people aren't willing to gradually work their way up. This is a concept that we've never even talked about. I, I've never actually heard it put this way, Mark. I have to be honest with you, where you look at your paper trading account as... Kind of, almost your goal, if you will. Almost like this is where I could be this if I was trading be, yes. from a state, from a carefree state <laughs> Absolutely. of mind. Absolutely. It's perfect. This is where I could be if I had that carefree state of mind. If I had the mental skills that allowed me to do exactly what I need to do without reservation, without hesitation, without fear. That's the way that we can, and that's, you know, and, and that's basically what we're getting at. How do we use the methodology that we have and the capability and the potential of that methodology to its maximum? You need the mental skills to do it. Um, you you made reference before uh, both uh, at Wise Fest and uh, earlier we talked about some of that, some pain, mm -hmm. pain in your life. And a, a lot of our traders right now feeling some pain with what's been happening in the markets the past couple of weeks. Mark, is there, um, does a person have to experience this, a, a total drawdown in their account, a total loss in their account where their account's almost wiped out or is totally wiped out for them to make that change in their mind? I mean, does that, does that have to happen? Does it, does it have to be traumatic like that for them to realize, oh, I've got to change something? Or, or, and and I'm, I'm saying this, and obviously it can be done without that, but have you found that predominantly out, out there, you know, in, in the people you've taught over the years, have people had to experience a high level of trauma before they can actually make the change? Or can someone just in the normal course of every day with a little bit of dedication actually? And I, and I'm not trying to be rhetorical here. <laughs> I really want a serious answer because there's people out there right now that I'm sure are thinking the same thing. Do I have to lose my whole account? Does this have to happen for me to make a, a well, You're in pain right now, are you, Jared? What's that? Yeah. <laughs> but I'm good. I've, I've been out of the Look, market a week. I'm just <laughs> yeah, well, You mean like the gutter principle? Yeah. The, is that what you're referring well, to? Explain like, the gutter principle. The gutter, yeah. the gutter principle. In other words, <laughs> how, how much in the gutter do you have to be before you're willing to say, um, uh, I'll do anything? Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, you get this kind of brings something up, is that when I was when I was actively coaching, um, uh, my my coaching clientele basically fell into two broad categories. Uh, one was with traders who were already successful, who were already consistent, and what they wanted were um, uh, you know they they wanted uh, fine tuning. Okay? okay, they wanted creative ways of fine tuning fine tuning themselves so that they could actually increase their you know increase the amount of money that they make over over a year or whatever. And then you had the other group was, was, was they're literally in the emotional gutter, okay? They're so exasperated. They're so frustrated because of the potential that they, it's so obvious what the potential is. And yet there seems to be these, these invisible barriers that keep them from getting into that, getting into that potential. That, that they're, they come to me saying, I'll do anything. I'll, and, and that's, you know, now everyone has different tolerances of pain before they get to the, get to the point where they say, I'll do anything and mean it and be sincere <laughs> and mean it. Well, and that's, mean that's, it. The that's the whole thing. They got to mean it. Mark, we, uh, we're wrapping up the show. We have a couple more minutes now. There, there was a, okay. a couple points I know you wanted to make before we end up this show. And, and uh, guys, just so you know, next show we're going to open up to phone calls and emails. So if you want to start lining up your emails or your phone calls, do that now. Mark, a uh, couple more minutes to go. Um, in, in in this arena, I mean, is there anything, any message you can give to our traders that, or any final thoughts, maybe some a mantra, something? <laughs> <laughs> no, just basically, just, just to kind of, you know, sum up what we've been talking about, that, that if, you know, if consistent results are your objective, you know, then, then you're going to have to learn how to think like a professional trader because that's, that's what they do. They make consistent results. That's, the, that's why they're pros. That's why people give them their money to manage. That's why they have jobs that were, where they actually trade for a living because if they didn't make consistent results, they wouldn't keep their jobs. And so to do that, you have to, you have to, you have to learn to change the way you think about trading in a way where it doesn't, doesn't 
cause you to have this potential to think that you're going to be disappointed or betrayed or put you into a state of emotional pain. Mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like getting to that carefree state of mind. And once you get to that, once you shift your perspective, everything changes. It's not about being right or wrong. And you know, when you really understand that, and, and then you go through the process of learning how to accept the risk of losing, then everything about your everything about your trading will change. So when the patterns present themselves, you trade them. You trade. You, you don't trade think them about it. There's fear, nothing to hesitation. think about. It's like don't think. There's nothing to think about. And you trade within your means. Except the risk and how you're going to take profits. <laughs> but I'm saying the pattern itself. When the pattern presents itself, there's absolutely nothing to think about. That is because the objective no part about trading. Because you can know. Yes, there's right. no way you can know what the outcome is going to be. Mark, <laughs> we do have another hour, like I said, okay. so uh, we, we've got plenty more time to go. Um, one last thing I wanted to ask you real quick. Uh, we've used this word edge yes. a couple of times. Right. A lot of our traders are not familiar with this word edge. I've used it on the floor. Edge to us was basically having a spread in there. In other words, if we had an option that was worth a buck, the ability to buy it for 90 cents or sell it for $1.10. Mm -hmm. How do you define edge uh, as, as a closing thought? Uh, just, just, just simply, just an edge is just a higher probability of one thing happening over another. That's all. Just, just a higher probability of one thing happening over another. But keep in mind that within the context of what we've been talking about, it's a higher probability happening over another over a series of trades. And a series, okay? So in other words, you know, like for an example, what I do is I teach people to, think, to trade in sample sizes. Right. So that, that instead of saying to themselves, I'm going to take the next trade, I'm going to take the next 20 trades. Right. I'm going to keep myself in the game. I'm going to keep myself in the game and see what happens over the next 20 trades. And then if I get the kind of results that I like, I'll take another 20. If I don't, I'll tweak my methodology so that I get better results. Mark, it's been great. We'll okay. see you back in a couple minutes. Guys, okay. it is time for a break. We want you to get your questions in for Mark. You can give us a call at 1-866-WTVYs. That's 1-866-988-9493. Or you can send us an email to trader at wisetradetv.com. When we come back, we will answer your questions and talk more about psychology in today's markets. We'll see you back here in five minutes. Jared are still here and ready to answer your questions. You can give us a call at 1-866-WTVYSE. That's 1-866-988-9493. Or you can email us to trader at wisetradetv.com. Guys, Mark, Susan. that was a great show. I loved all the information you gave everyone. Thank you, Susan. Thank, Thank you very Thank you much. so much Let's for being guys. here. I, I know at Wise Fest, everybody was thrilled uh, to actually get to meet you and see you in person. So it's a it's a special <laughs> pleasure to have you as a uh, special on WTV. Thank you. Different for me. I've never been on live TV before, so this is. Uh... <laughs> well, you're doing a great job. Thanks. Well, you know, guys, we have lots of callers and emails to no surprise. So why don't we get right to the phones? Let's go. Um, we have a call from Brandon in Massachusetts. Good morning, Brandon. Hello, guys. Brandon, hey. And lady. <laughs> Good morning. What's your question for Mark? Um, it's it's not really uh, too much of a question. It's mainly I'm a I'm a complete clean slate. I learned how to trade through Wise Trade. I didn't know anything before, and uh, I just thought you guys want a perspective of of not knowing anything. And your analogies that you used w were great. It, it really made me understand what what's going on. And what I, I just want you to comment on what, what I've taken from it. That's oh, okay. Yeah, we'd ahead, love Brandon. to hear it. These, these are the things that I've gotten. Why, why is trading not guaranteed? It's because prices are determined on predictions of what other people will do. And technology can record what other people have done in the past, but cannot predict what people will do in the future. Right? To a point, yeah. yeah. No, they can predict what people will do in the future, but just not on a not, just not on a on a trade by trade basis. In other words, you're going to get it's it's like I'm going to go back to the coin. If if you what what wise trade or technical methodologies do is give you a weighted coin, where if I've got a coin that says that 70 percent of the time that you flip this coin, it's going to come up heads, then that's what your technology that's what your your tech not your 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 technical methodology does it gives you that that whatever percentage edge it just means that on each individual trade which is what the tendency that most people have to do is they try to figure out if this trade is going to work not if the next not what what's my percentage of wins to losses over the next 20 trades or the next 10 trades or the next 100 trades 
That's a good point. Edge. Edge. That's a good right. point, Edge. Jared. Okay, Brandon. Well, thank you for calling on that. We have another caller. It's Miss Amber in California. Good morning, Amber. Hey, Amber. <laughs> Susan, Jared, Mark, hello. <laughs> How's it going? Good to hear from you. Oh, yes. Hey, you know what? Thank you, Susan. Um, Mark, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Your book, on um, Trading in the Zone, I read it cover to cover. I love it. <laughs> um, I think it's Neuro Linguistics for um, Trading. And for traders, and um, I loved what you said about scaling out of positions. That made so much sense to me. There are, there are little bits and pieces in that book, you know, that, that a lot of people don't. It's not just, you know, blanket psychology. I mean, there, there's so many little little um, intricacies in that book that will help you with your individual trading if you, if, you, if you pick them out. Talk about scaling out. Where did you... Come well, up with, uh, I mean, obviously. <laughs> no, 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 you, no. Where I, where I, where it occurred to me to scale out was was back uh, when I first started trading. Um, well, not exactly when I first started trading, but uh, while I was working at Merrill Lynch at the Chicago Board of Trade as as a retail broker, by the way. And and I and I used to keep meticulous records, and I would analyze my trades, and I found that. Um, and I found that that rarely did I get into a trade where it just stopped me out immediately. In other words, where the market never gave me anything. In other words, I get into a trade. Let's say I bought at ten, mm -hmm. and next thing you know, price is at nine. It never it never went to eleven. Okay, right. so that was maybe one out of ten times that that would happen. And then and then I saw that that you know that there were certain percentages of my trades where it went. If I bought at ten, it it would go to twelve or go to thirteen, and then go back through my entry point and stop me out at at you know let's say six or seven. So it actually gave me something, but I didn't take it because I was looking for something more. And so what I did is I analyzed my trades in this way and put them into categories in terms of the percentage times that, that it would go in my favor in relationship to when it didn't, and and found that I could I could best um, I could give myself consistent results if. I, if I started scaling out, in other words, I would take a part of my position off at a very small amount. You know, let's say, you know, just just to make it easy, I trade a lot of silver and gold back then. But but just to make it easy, where I would take um, a first third of my position off at uh, let's say three or four cents in silver. Okay. And what that would do is is that would not only make me a winner from a psychological perspective. If you really want to look at this, you know, psychologically, what you want to do is you want to create a belief. You actually want to create th this belief inside of you that I am a consistent winner. Right. And what will happen is that when, that when that belief gets integrated into your mental, you know, as part of into, into your, your, your mental environment, as part of your identity, as is, is long as, of course, the steps that go into making I am a consistent winner are, are, are consistent with that belief. In other words, it becomes a part of your identity and just, it, it just function out of that belief in a way that you don't even have to think about it anymore. That's no, your, that increases your confidence. That's really right. The it not increases. It, it's just who you are. So in other words, if I want to, if I want to actually believe that I'm a consistent winner, then, then, I have to, then I have to do something that creates that. So by taking off at least a third of my position with, with a small amount, what that would do is that would that would reduce my risk. So if the market did go back and stop me out, it wasn't stopping me out of my whole position, and uh, and uh, uh, you know. But if it didn't, then of course I had a I had a spot where the next third came off, and then a, then then a, a predetermined spot where the next third came off. And now the problem with with do with with scaling out that a lot of people have is that if they get into a monster trade. They're, they're lost in a, potential. Yeah, the lost potential of, you know, like, oh, if I had the whole thing on, I'd have just made so much money. But, again, it's like, it's, it's, what's your objective? If your objective is to, to get those monster trades, then it's going to be inconsistent with producing consistent results. So you have to be clear about what it is that you're trying to accomplish. You know, I really like that, Mark, because uh, there are a couple of things you said that I really like, and one is setting yourself up for success. And it's sort of like what you do uh, with your children when they're smaller. You want to reinforce the positive things that they're doing correctly because then they know, you know what, I can do this. And so by taking those smaller, those profits as they're coming, you do have that mental state. Absolutely. So. It's really critical. It's really important. I think it's one of the most. Once people get some of the some some of the fundamental skills out of the way, it is one of it is probably the most important thing they can do for themselves. Is is what I call take money as the market makes it available. Have a plan for taking the money as the market makes it available. Because we don't know how far it's going to go. In I do something either. called kibbles and bits, where I just say, right. you know what, I could just try and grab five and ten cents. I know that with my trading, from what I've done in the past, and based on tool that I'm using, it's very easy for me to grab ten, twenty cents out of each of my options. Now, if the 
option costs two dollars or three dollars, you know that could be thirty percent or ten percent of my of my trade, depending upon the cost of the option. So little bits and pieces, just trying to eke out um, small wins, and that again right. instills confidence, makes me feel good in my trades. Absolutely. Well, we have another caller on the line. It is Lee in Ohio. Good morning, Lee. Hey, how y'all doing today? Hey, Lee. It's good to hear from you. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> I just, you know, I talked to you when I was down at Wise Fest, and a lot of things that you were all, that you were talking about, you know, I was telling people and teaching people. But once I talked to you in the way that you really summed some things up, it just really just brought it even to light even more for me. Now, one thing it has did, it made me trade so much from a carefree state that <laughs> if, I see, if I see a fresh cross on a day and a good month and a good week, I get in it and I mess around and be in 20 different trades. <laughs> but, so, Could there be too much of a carefree state of mind? <laughs> you say what? I was asking Mark if there could be too much of a carefree state of mind. <laughs> well, I mean, I look at it and it really it took me. I mean, the only thing that I don't play is earnings. Okay. And it took me to, and I was me and you were just talking about it yesterday, Jared. It took me to the mindset that I don't care what the market is doing. If I see the charts is right, I'm getting in, period. Right. I don't even think about nothing else. And it's so funny, when the market went down, I lost some money, and a couple of my friends called me, and they was like, you should sell everything, you should sell everything. Look at <laughs> your account. And I'm laughing. I'm laughing at them. They was like, why are you laughing? I was like, I'm going to win some, I'm going to lose some. I ain't worried about it. I'll make it back. Yes. You know? And, and that was my mindset. And it, it's just funny that when you get that mindset, you, you don't just think, you don't even think about nothing else. Yeah, Lee, it's important for you still to have a plan. <laughs> oh, no, I got a plan. I got a plan now. Yeah. No, I, I do have a plan. And at least, at least defense, if, if there's one thing Lee has, it's a plan. But I, it, it's funny when you said the carefree state of mind. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's more. Now, what you do talk about is something called euphoric trading. Yeah, yeah, or that's euphoria. Yeah. That's yeah. euphoria. That, that's different. Well, there could be something here with that. Uh, there, there could be an element of that. With, with Lee. You want me to cover that? Or is yeah. That, could yeah. You talk? I think oh, it's a great idea. Well, it, you know. Um, all of us, um, let's put it this way, we talked about expectations in the first segment. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, when uh, an expectation is simply, you know, a mental representation of what some future moment in the environment is going to look like, sound like, feel like, taste like, or, or smell like, okay? Mm -hmm. In other words, if, if the environment, if I believe that the environment is going to be a certain way, the outside environment is a certain way based on my mental representation, if it shows up that way, if it shows up exactly that way, how do I feel? Well, universally, how this is this is a characteristic that runs through all cultures. This is a universal human characteristic. How do I feel? Thanks. I mean, got, I mean, you're gonna feel good, right? Yeah, you're gonna feel satisfied. Good. Yeah, it yeah. could. Yeah, it could. There could be a range of really positive emotions. Okay, that and and this is this is universal. And at, by the same token, the degree to which the environment does not conform to our expectations, how do we feel? A, a whole a whole range, you know, like I brought up before, disappointment, dissatisfied, betrayed, whatever, okay? Yeah, usually it's extremes, like omnipotence yeah, well, and, like, total failure. Well, well, <laughs> well, the, well the thing is, is that, <laughs> is that all of us have this potential to, to flip into a euphoric state of mind. And a euphoric state of mind is one where, for whatever reason, whatever expectations we had, let's say the environment showed up in a way that far exceeded what we thought, and it's just like we're, 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 we're as high as a kite. And what happens is that these, these chemicals get in, you know, chemicals get released in our, in our mind and our body, and, and the problem with, the, I mean, euphoric, euphor, a genuinely euphoric state of mind can be like heaven, literally like heaven on earth. Yeah. And, and the problem as traders when we're in a euphoric state of mind is that in a state of mind of heaven on earth, it is impossible for us to conceive that anything could go wrong. <laughs> anything. Impossible. That's when the stops come off. That's Impossible, the, exactly. The risk and so, yeah, and, and, and I've worked with so many traders, and I can say that, that I've worked with traders who, who have, let's say, their threshold for euphoria was one winning trade, okay? Oh, wow. and, and there are others who, you know, maybe a string of four or five winning trades or, or two or three winners and a big monster or whatever. But the point is, is that, is that there's, a, there's a state at which we can operate at normal confidence in which, in which we, can, we can do all the things, stay in the process of trading, meaning that, you know, we're objectively, we're objectively executing our edges, we're predefining our risk, we're cutting our losses, we have a plan for, you know, taking profits on a 
consistent basis. And then when you flip into the state of euphoria, all that changes because absolutely nothing can go wrong. And as traders, that's one of the most dangerous places to be because, because even though you may perceive that nothing can go wrong. The market may not agree with you. And that's when we have this tendency to, to violate money management principles, where if we're a thousand share trader, we'll put 10,000 shares on, you know, we'll mortgage the house or whatever, because the trade just absolutely, there's no possible way it could be a loser. And in these situations, what happens is that when we've got 10 times the amount of exposure than that we're used to, then all it takes is just a, just a tiny, tiny little bit that the market can come against our position, just a tiny bit. And it can, it can, it can, we can go from the state of euphoria to a state of terror instantaneously. Because of what you just said, you were a thousand share trader who now committed 10,000 shares to this trade because you were in this euphoric state. Wow. When the thing flipped down, your loss is now way outside of what you call the norm. Well, it doesn't or, even have to you, be a big or, loss. It doesn't even have to be. It could just be the fact that nothing could go wrong. And so therefore, you know, it, it's, it, it, does it, it, it does, it just, it just shatters, it shatters the state of euphoria so that we go from heaven virtually to mental hell instantaneously and it puts us in a state of mind freeze where we just can't even get out of the trade and we're just sort of, just sort of watching the market take our money away and not able to do anything about it until something snaps inside of us and we get out. So that mid zone. You kind of want to stay in that. Yeah, you want to stay in things. normal confidence. And what I was picking up about Lee was that he, he may not be violating money management principles, but when he realized that he could trade from a carefree state of mind, he was kind of doing many trades. You see, just he didn't have a didn't, he might not have been planning all these trades out <laughs> and just going from you know instead of doing if he was a thousand lot trader or a thousand share trader instead of doing ten thousand shares, if he was just trading one or two markets, he's trading twenty. Okay, right. you know. So we have a, uh, an email from Ed, the Philly Pip Collector. He said, did most of the knowledge that you're sharing today come to you from your mentor or mentors or from practical experience? How long of a period of time did it take you to trade without fear from the time you started trading with real money? Thank you again for the benefit of your knowledge and expertise. Um, the first part of the question Who is how long... Who did you learn from and, and how long did you trade with Who your... Who did I learn from? I didn't. I started doing. I started writing the Discipline Trader in 1982. There, there wasn't really there. Back in 1982, there weren't even that many trading books available. So this was a personal and, revelation. Yeah, and there, so this was your, from your yeah, own experience. Yeah, this that is, you're this is all this from my stuff. own experiences. Yeah, as, as a matter of fact, it, it had to do with, with you know, losing everything that I owned as a trader, and and at the same time, uh, uh, having uh, at the same time being in a situation where I was at Merrill Lynch. You know where where I was observing, uh, you know, not only other brokers in the office, but but the behavior of my customers, their customers, having uh, having relationships with floor traders, noticing these 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 common themes of, of of errors that we were all making, and then when I when I ended up losing everything that I owned, that I didn't, I, I was in a state of mind where I didn't have anything else to lose. Other than maybe my job, because you know Merrill Lynch would have known the situation, I'm sure they would have fired me, but uh, but they didn't, and so I was able to not trade anymore because I didn't have any more, I didn't have any money, but at least I, I still had access to the markets. I still had access to being a trader, and and when people really genuinely tap out, they don't get to trade anymore because they don't have the financial resources to do it. Right. So I was in a, I was in kind of a unique situation where. Where one, I, I and this I can't, I can't. Well, I, I could probably explain it, but I'm not going to do it here. In that, I just knew that sci that trading was psychological right from the very start. I just, it was just, it just made sense to me that this had, it wasn't technical as much as psychological. So, is it because of your observation of not only what was happening to you, but yes. everybody around you, yes. and then you had bottomed out? Yes. So you you got I, rid of the fear there yeah, because had, you I had, had already experienced. Yes, I had journal. Yes, I had extensive journal work that I that I did. And so so in in 1982, you know, when I came to these realizations about myself and about trading, and when I didn't have anything more to lose, everything about my trading changed because because mm -hmm. it, it was like the fear dissipated, and it's like I started making consistent money for my customers mm -hmm. because I was I I was doing the same things, but I was doing it from a different perspective. And, and not making the errors. So the second part of his question referred to the time it took you to get over your fear, and you think it was more, or you say it was more like a, almost a, an instantaneous... Well, yeah, it was, it was an instantaneous, not a, maybe an instantaneous realization, but it was because of these experiences. Right. And so what I started doing is, is developing the material that en ended up in the Discipline Trader. What, what I didn't anticipate, because I, I, never, I never grew up uh, aspiring to be a writer or thought that I would be, 
uh, is that, I mean, having very much of a trader's mentality back then, I would say, you know, okay, this is going to take me six or eight months to do this. It ended up taking me almost eight years. And, and it, was, it was tapping basically where this insight comes from as I tapped into the creative process. What I, what I mean is I specifically stayed away from any other material that had anything to do with even psychology or trading. There wasn't really anything on trading psychology anyway except for one book, Jake Bernstein's Investor's Quotient that came out in 1980. But otherwise, I specifically stayed away from it because I realized if you ask yourself questions from a, from a sincere space of, of being open to any answer that comes, you'd get any answer that comes. And so I was really developing this material as, as, a, as I was going along. Very good. Well, we have uh, another caller on the line. Good morning, Keith. How are you? Good morning. Keith, I'm good morning. great. What question do you have for Mark? The question I have for Mark is this. You're speaking of um, you know, learning to get into that uh, carefree state of mind and starting small. You said, you know, example, 10 shares uh, to gain that consistency. When would you then increase it? I mean, you know, 70%, 80% then increase? What would you be your guideline or would you go by a psychological guideline? That's my question. Interesting one. Thanks, Keith. I'd go by a psychological guideline. In other words, when you can trade 10 shares perfectly, in other words, when you can set up a trading plan and execute that plan, when I, when I mean perfectly, I literally mean not just execute the plan perfectly, but execute it without any conflicting or competing thoughts about what you need to do and when you need to do it. In other words, it wouldn't even occur to you to make a trading error. And then what you do is you move up to the next level and see and see how well you do. Is P and L an equation here? Profit and loss is that an equation? In the, in well, it, it, not necessarily. I mean, you know, you can do an exercise like that and not and not even take profit and loss into consideration. That, in other words, there are many times I've set up for people, you know, uh, trading exercises that really didn't take into consideration how much profit they might have. It was following the plan. It was following because the plan because we know we're going to lose. Jared. That's right. Right. It's so following you can the plan. live with that loss and right. just keep moving forward. Exactly. In other words, how well can you follow the plan? And then if you can follow the plan without any conflicting or competing thoughts to do other than what you set out to do, then you up your size. And if you're, and if you're real comfortable right off the bat, you can up your size even more. But if you find you're not comfortable and, you're, and, you, and, you, and you find yourself you know, making trading errors or even thinking about making trading errors, then stay at that level until that doesn't happen anymore. That's great advice. Thank you for that. Uh, we have another caller. Frank is the first time calling in. Thank you for doing that, Frank. What can we do for you? Frank, are you there? These are good questions, by the way, that people are giving us. Good they stuff. They really are, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't think we have Frank on the line, so let me go to one of our emails. This um, is a, it says, since you cannot know that a trade will be a winner when you enter it for the same reason, can I assume that a profit target is the same psychology? Assuming that the next tick after I exit a trade, after reaching my pre-assigned target profit, will be a down tick is the same false assumption as when I enter the trade, thinking that the next tick will be an uptick, that I must wait for the market to tell me that the trade is over. We'll so it's kind of the reverse. Email. Yeah, it's, there's no way to know how, how far a market's going to go in your favor. There's just you just have to pick these predetermined spots, and or if you don't pick predetermined spots, then then use some sort of an indicator like another fresh cross, or or a trailing stop to to get you out of your to get you out of your trades. Very good. Right. Okay, our next email is from Hal in Pennsylvania. And he says, hi, Jared, uh, Mark, and Susan, on behalf of all the wise traders, I want to thank you for this great opportunity to listen to Mark. The question I have for Mark is, over the years, have you found that a day trader can be as successful as a swing trader or long-term trader, provided stops are in place and a good trading plan is in place? It doesn't it really how you how you uh, categorize the way people trade is, is virtually it, it isn't even relevant. In other words, there it depends on how you think about your trading and and what you're what you're most comfortable with. So, I, I would yeah, think that, I would know. think that your trading style has to fit your personality yes, right. and That's and right. your time allotment. That's I mean, right. Yeah. Yeah, so a day trader who's got, got their mind right is going to be just as successful as a swing trader who's got their mind right. And, and a swing trader who doesn't won't be any more successful than a day trader who doesn't. So. Well, Jared, you touched on something that uh, earlier when I was watching uh, the program, I thought we would ask Mark. If somebody is new to trading and they watch Wise Trade TV and they see that we have all different trade styles and we even have all different markets, uh, a common question we get is, how do I determine 
you know, what trade style is suitable for me? And how do you think that from a psychological standpoint? Not necessarily, you know, maybe they can spend all day at the computer and they have time to do that, but for who they are, how do you help determine what type of trader is more suitable for their personality? Hmm, that's a good question. <laughs> and it's kind of, kind of tough one to answer to. Um, I mean, you'd probably have to meet the person. In yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, it's 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 all it's like even when you do personal consultations, it's like what what I you certainly what I realize is that is that you can't put you can't put people into into categories or you know or pigeonhole them into into certain boxes. That everyone's mental ecology is unique, and you have to respond to that kind of uniqueness. So, how a person goes about determining you know what trading style is uh, is most appropriate for them would, would pretty much be based on what they're attracted to. In other words, you know, even for me, for an example, for many years, I mean, I learned, well, I learned to trade as a swing trader because we didn't have access back in the late 70s and early 80s. We didn't have access to market information. We, there, there weren't all these platforms and, and you know, and computer, I mean, because personal computer hadn't even been invented yet. So, when, you know, what we had to do is we had to call our broker for the high, low, and close and keep our own bar charts. So, so the day trade was absolutely, was, was absolutely impossible, right. a day trade away from the market, not being on the floor. However, and so because that's the way I know how to trade, you know, years later, it's like, you know, I'm kind of losing interest in trading. And, I'm, and, and the reason why is because I don't have the toleration to sit in front of the screen all day long to wait for two or three trades. Right. I, my, 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 my nature is that, you know, I want to be active. And if I'm going to sit in front of the screen, I want to trade. So basically, I had to come to the realization for myself that, you know what, even though, yes, I know how to swing trade successfully, I got to learn how to day trade successfully or otherwise I won't do it at all. So, you know. So, in a way, yeah. if you think about somebody that likes to go skydiving and, you know, drive fast cars, and they're really always wanting kind of that high adrenaline, position trading to them would probably be very boring. That's right. Absolutely. So, kind of take a look at yourself like that. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's get our next caller. It's Doug in California. Thanks for calling in, Doug. What question do you have for Mark? Well, uh, first, Mark, thanks for being there. And um, I uh, had a, a comment and then a question, which is that I, I read your book, and I saw you at Wisefest, and I've seen the DVD, all the DVDs, and uh, they were wonderful and life-changing and, and, and great. Uh, so I just wanted to thank you very much about that. Thank you. Um, I, I seem to need one more thing, which is I needed to get smacked. <laughs> <laughs> Mark I, does that for a small fee, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Oh, that's all I can afford. Not that. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I worked in high tech, and I understand Google and Apple, and I, you know, I, I knew the iPhone was going to be a big deal, and I knew that Google wouldn't be making a hardware phone. And all that. And basically, I was really arrogant, and it took those things cratering for it to really hit home that my my knowledge was nothing. It was worthless. And it's just exactly what you've been saying. And I had the theoretical knowledge, but now I got it for real. So I'm making some big changes. And it's, you're, just, you're just a life changer, Mark. Anyway, my question is, do you know of any, like, uh, lotion for, for thinning skulls when somebody has a really thick skull? <laughs> you know, just, just kidding. For thinning it's, skulls. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, he has a thick skull. Oh, oh, lotion oh, for thinning a skull. Okay, I'm sorry. Do I, do I, is there a lotion? Is that what you're saying? Right. Oh. How do you help a thick skull? But you know, so is, is there is there any way other than the hard way to to uh, get through these lessons that I guess most traders seem to need to get through? It, 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 nothing has to be hard. It's just it, truly, it, I've learned that nothing has to be hard. It's just it's just a matter of. of of how strong your desire is. In other words, if you can, and, and this is one of the reasons why I'm even here in the first place, that if, it's, if, if I can say something that makes this connection between where you're at right now and where you'd like to be, uh, you know, more tangible, then the, let's say, the enthusiasm that you might generate to get there will be enough to cause you to focus on whatever it is that you need to do to get there. In other words, to take, you know, to, to break, to take your goal or your objective, break it down or, or create a process for yourself, break the process down to its smallest incremental steps and then just take one step at a time. So it doesn't have to be hard, but you just have to really want to do it. And that wanting has to be genuine. You can't give lip, ser lip service to that desire. It has to be genuine. And, and really, and, 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 this is, and this is really good. I mean, this is, this is really the secret. So when I say it's genuine, what that means is that whatever you need will come into your life. I guarantee you that. What, if, if your desire is genuine, whatever you need will come into your life. And that's because we have the power within us. That's right. To bring it out. That's right. Okay. Right. Um, we have another caller. It's Rich in California. Hi, Rich. 
Morning, all. Morning, hey. Mark. How you all doing? Hey, Rich. Good. Hey, Mark, I want to thank you, but you've really made a big difference in the way I trade, too. And one of the things I found was that it forced me to create a worksheet uh, mm -hmm. that I follow so that I could follow 20 trades at a time. And I really am following your system to the T. Some of the things that I found that it's done for me is it's it's made me see my mistakes because they're on paper. Yeah. It's also helped me stay very consistent. And uh, what I'm finding from the consistency is once I get through a certain amount of trades and I go back and I and now that I have a record of each trade, I look and see what consistently was going wrong, what was consistently going right. Mm -hmm. I then make adjustments for my next 20 trades. The other thing I'm finding Perfect. now that I'm wow. really That's... becoming very profitable is that I could actually get into what some other people would consider more risky trades, but because I'm staying consistent with my stops and, and my strategy, it's not a risky trade to me because I know those stops are going to take me out and it takes the emotion out of it. Right. Perfect. I want to thank you for everything. Yeah, you're welcome, Rich. I thank you for calling and, and sharing that with us. It's like it's like one of the things that, that you're realizing is that when you take a consistent approach, which most people don't have, they actually have a random approach and don't know it. But when you take a consistent approach, you, you're learning what works and what doesn't, and you become confident in your ability to be able to assess that. Mm -hmm. Whereas with people, they're taking a random approach. They don't know, ever learn what works and what doesn't because they're using an unlimited number of variables to generate a trade. In other words, when they get into a trade, when they get a signal and they start building a case one way or the other, either take the trade or not take the trade, all the, all the let's say, the rationale that they're using to build that case or, or to take it or not take it is are, are, are these unlimited variables that they're adding into the equation which prevents them from ever learning what works or what doesn't. And correcting the proper thing. I mean, you can't, yeah, exactly. you can't tweak a variable if you know right. what variable you change. <laughs> Absolutely right. <laughs> Well, Mark, right. I, I think it's wonderful uh, that Rich called in. We have a stack of emails, and uh, a huge number of them are not questions for you. They are thanking you because they have read your book, they've watched your DVD, and they are on their way to, you know, making better trades. So Good. that's wonderful. Well, thanks. Uh, we have an email here from Roger in Toronto, and he says, "I like to thank Wise Trade TV, the Wise Trade TV team." And Mark, for this wonderful enlightening session, timing is perfect now. I'm in the state of disappointment because of big losses. My question is how a strong and carefree mind, which is a consistent state of mind, can analyze the randomness to create the consistency. What do I have to give up to change my way of thinking? Here's that question again. Boy, I analyze the consistency. I have to read that question. Can I see that question? Yeah, it's my question. Here, right there, Jared. There you go, Mark. He's referring to accepting randomness to create consistency. How strong, <laughs> how strong and carefree mind, which is consistent, and I can analyze the randomness. Here, first of all, uh, as I kind of break that question down, you're not analyzing the randomness, for one thing. Uh, you're not analyzing at all. What you're doing is you're, you're buying or developing a methodology that just finds patterns in collective human behavior. So the idea that you have to analyze anything is, is probably where the problem is. You're not analyzing randomness. All you're doing is accepting. accepting. You're accepting the fact that the outcome to the pattern is random. And that's probably the best I could do without having, talking to having him personally. Faith in, right. Having yeah. faith in your yeah. tool is what he's saying. Is yeah. The market is a random event. The tool gives you edge. Accepting that you don't have, you know, just like Doug's example, you may be a software engineer who worked for Apple for many years, and you may feel that Apple, in this particular situation, because of the way that I feel about it, because of my experience, therefore Apple is bound to work out. You have to realize it's totally random, and each individual event that takes place is random, and that specific event in that moment in time is not any special than the one before it. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So to give you, here, can I elaborate on that just Absolutely. a minute? Sure. You were down on the floor, mm -hmm. okay? And, 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 and when I was in Chicago doing consulting work, I had a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of floor trader clients and friends. You love those guys, didn't you? Yeah, oh, absolutely. We had a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a world. <laughs> it's changed a lot now. But anyway, it's like so. So I would be. Well, I would be trading from a monitor, and 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 I traded support and resistance. And all support is is that it, it's it's a previous swing high or swing you know support of swing low and it's resistance a swing high, where where when you look at when you, when when you look at what happened, it's like when the market stops at a particular price, it means there wasn't anybody there wasn't anybody in the world at that point that was willing to bid it one tick higher or offer it on a, on a low, one tick lower. Now, when it, when it reaches that point again, you have to ask yourself, is, 
is there going to be, is there enough momentum here, is there enough conviction in the market for someone to actually bid it past that price? And, you know, and that's, the, that's the kind of assessment that, let's say, that you make when, you, when you're trading from a subjective point of view, not a, not a what I call a mechanical point of view when you're learning how to, how to think in probabilities. But, but just to make the example, is that, is that when, market, it, when the market would come up to resistance or down to support, basically all you're looking for is pretty much the same people that supported the price the last time or chances are they're going to come back in the market because they made money the last time right. they they bought they absorbed all the all the sell orders with enough conviction to to rally the market and so they made money chances are they're going to do it again you trade it and chances are doing and trade it until it doesn't work anymore but the point is is that because i the reason why i understood that is because i actually knew the traders who did it <laughs> you see, I, just like on the floor. You could see you, them and hear yeah, them. And you, not only did I see it on the hand. charts, but I talked to them later on that day. They were the ones that did it. And there were times, for an example, when, when I'm thinking, okay, I wonder if so-and-so is going to do this and that. And, and the trade didn't work. Support failed because guess what? They were at lunch. Right. <laughs> <laughs> <Been there. laughs> That's simple. Okay. They were at lunch. <laughs> Very good. Okay. We have an email from Christopher in California. He says, I look at a lot of trades and don't get in. Then I get frustrated because the price that I could have gotten in at would have created a winner for me. This happens all the time, yet I still hesitate to get in. Any recommendations? Well, I, I don't, one, I don't know if that, that person should be paper trading at least. I mean, they, they, they can't tell me that they can't get in paper trading. I mean, that would be very unusual. I'm not saying it's not impossible, but, you know, right. but, but at least paper trading, they, they should be practicing getting in. And then when they're real comfortable with their ability to do this, you know, just if it trade, they trade one share. Tra it's, it's the fear that, of pulling that's a, the trigger. Right. That's, that's a trading right. error. And that's right. You used the term trading error before. That's a trading error, not yeah. getting in. That's right. right. Yeah, absolutely. It's not, yeah, that's a when trading error. you get error. your signal, you don't get in, that's, that's right. a trading error. So, so trade it, paper trade it until you can do it really comfortably. And then, and then if it, you know, and then go to one share. Well, you know, that's something that we talk about uh, at Global Tech. We have clients that get the software, and but they forever paper trade. Right. <laughs> and it's like, come on, just go in, do a trade, you know, buy 10 shares, do anything. Right. Just make a real trade and right. immediately get out of it just so you have the experience of making a real trade. Right. Get your mind over it. It's going to be okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have another caller on the line. It's Mark in New York. Hello, Mark. Hi, how you doing today? Hey, Mark. Great. Thanks for calling in. What do you have for uh, Mark here? I have, I have a couple of questions and comments for Mark. First of all, I love both your books, um, Trading in the Zone and uh, The Disciplined Trader. They, they've helped me tremendously. Um, and what I've done is I, I'm consistently looking for about 15 pips trading the Forex. Okay. And um, I've calculated that with two lots or two mini lots or whatever I'm trading, um, over a period of two months that I could double my account if, if I do that consistently um, four days a week. Okay. So, and, and I've been playing with, with small amounts of money and staying on track with that. So um, that, that mental game has really helped me to, to not just always be looking at the computer 24 hours a day, seeing what's out there. It's, it's looking for one particular trade at a specific time of day. Right. Um, uh, I have a question for you in relation to your background. I, I have extensive training in NLP and hypnosis and other related fields, and you seem to talk a lot in the same language. Have you studied NLP or hypnosis at all? No, not really. Uh, when I first started developing this material back in, in, like I said, 1982, I think NLP was just beginning, and uh, I don't know exactly, exactly when it started, but... Um, but uh, I, I did look into NLP at the time, but at that time, it wasn't really very evolved like it is, like I'm sure it is now, in that uh, NLP back in the early 80s was used mostly um, as a kind of mental manipulative technique for salespeople. And, it, and, and it, yeah, really, and it, and it really didn't appeal to me. And, and, and when I made up my mind that it didn't appeal to me, I just, I just didn't go back to it ever again, so... And as far as hypnosis is concerned, I mean, I've, I've used, uh, I've used self-hypnosis for myself in terms of, you know, making my own uh, self-hypnosis tapes and, and, you know, putting certain um, uh, affirmations. affirmations on the tape and, and listening to it over and over again. But I don't have a, like, an educational background in, in hypnosis, if that's what you're asking. He, he was swinging this clock in front of was it? <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, well, really good. Guys, we have an interesting email. Uh, this is from Susan in Houston. 
And she says, hi, everybody. You are all so great. My question to Mark is that I have been trading about seven years. I traded early on and learned of a lot of what you're saying by trial and error. I have spent several years learning about the market, thinking I could be perfect and get through this with no pain if I did. I have taught my daughter how to trade, and she's making thousands. I sit here, and I have this wall, and I don't trade. I want to desperately. I can see all the trades and know what to do. I guess I need courage. Somewhere I went wrong for me. What would you say to me? Thanks in advance. Somewhere you went wrong for me. Um, she taught her daughter how to trade successfully. Yeah. She knows what she's doing, but she just can't she have the courage a, to do it. Was this an event that, that well, stopped her from... No, I would say it's her... her, her uh, it's, she's probably so much of a perfectionist that it would make it extremely difficult. To, but people who have a tendency to be extremely, you know, oriented towards perfection would find it very difficult to trade because you have to you really have to think in probabilities and and a probabilistic mindset is almost the exact opposite of a perfectionist mindset and so what she's going to be looking is is that even though she sees the signals and she sees what her daughter does and 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 her daughter's being successful at it the fact and is she taught her it, daughter yeah and she so taught she her knows daughter it. the fact is when you get right down to it she wants every single trade to work so and, maybe maybe you know, accept the fear no, just accept the fact that that you know it's all right if it doesn't work. Right. That you know that's it's all right if it doesn't conform to your expectation, and that's where she has to change. Okay, Susan, I hope that helps. Uh, we have Wayne on the line in Maryland. Good morning, Wayne. Hi, how you doing? Um, a really good session. I was just listening to it the last hour and a half, and um, I just wanted to add something, which I agree with Mark a thousand percent on trading psychology. Um, the consistency factor that you're doing something consistent and if it goes against you you have to know that it's normal like the normal cycles and patterns of a stock and if you're getting into a good stock that goes against you you shouldn't really panic because it went down like if, for instance what's happening with Apple nowadays it's going through its normal pattern because it went up so much and to add to that what could help some people's fears is by doing other measures, buying a protective put or uh, active trade in other stocks to bring in money while they're watching that. I think, it, yeah. let me actually, I, I want to ask a question on the heels of your question, Wayne. If normal patterns and cycles, okay, well, first of all, you know, what is normal? But a, a normal, you know, average trading range of a stock. Mm -hmm. What Wayne's saying is different. I think basically what you, the point that you make is you have to be willing to stop yourself, have, it, have a stop loss in place. Mm -hmm. I don't want our traders to think, okay, this is a normal movement for a stock, therefore I'll just let it go down outside of my stop loss, outside of what I thought because that's normal for the stock itself. In other words, if a stock is, um, has a certain volatility factor and you can't tolerate that volatility factor, you probably shouldn't be trading that stock. Mm -hmm. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Anything that anything that causes you to to anything that causes you to let's say experience market information being potentially painful will take you out of an objective state of mind. Now, as long as he's in an objective state of mind and he's making an ob objective assessment as to what the possibilities are, and he's still looking at it from a perspective of you know what there's there's a catastrophic loss. In other words, there's there's a level at which no matter what I think, I'm I'm not going to tolerate being in this trade if if Apple trades beyond this level. Then, then he's fine. He's making what I call subjective decisions. In other words, you can you can trade mechanically, you can trade subjectively, and subjectively would be an analogy would be people who um, uh, who um, play uh, Texas Hold'em for an example. When you, when you start playing poker, what you're doing is you're playing your hand, and you're not really because you're learning. You're not really paying attention to what possibly other people are doing. But actually, you'll eventually evolve to the point where you'll play your hand in combination with what you've learned about the way other poker players at the table are behaving. In other words, they're, they're tells. And then you'll get to the point where you can actually not even have to look at your cards, you're just going to play the players. Mm -hmm. You can evolve as a trader to actually trade in a way where you can trade subjectively by asking yourself several if-then questions and determine pretty much what people are thinking in a way where you can make these objective assessments about what the potential is for, the, for, for a particular stock or commodity or whatever to do what it's going to do. But at the same time, you always have in mind, you know, what does the market have to do to tell me that, that whatever I think isn't working? So you've got your basic objective criteria, right. and once you become more advanced, you can use the right. subjective mind That's right. to influence. Right. right, but I would not suggest people get into subjective trading until they've got this mechanical part down pat. Right. Absolutely. They've got, otherwise, they're just going to get really screwed up.
Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, well, we have another caller on the line. It's Kevin in Florida, and this is your first time calling. Thanks for calling in, Kevin. Hi, Susan. How are you? I'm um, watching Wise Trade. It's the first time caller, so I'm a little bit nervous. Oh, welcome. Um, I'd like to say yeah, hi to Jared and, and Mr. <laughs> Douglas. Um, the question I have is that, you know, I've been uh, uh, trading since uh, November of last year, paper trading, and then I went live trade um, in October. Um, I was listening to uh, uh, Mark, and I've been reading his book, uh, Disciplined Trader. Um, the, the question I have for him, he, was think, he said that um, don't think on your trades. Um, the problem I've been having is that you seem like you have so much information, wise trade, and then I'm watching uh, CNN on my uh, TV. I have a laptop, which I'm, I'm watching my uh, 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 trading company trading my stock, right. and it just seems like it's overwhelming. And he come out with just a simple thing, don't think when you trade, but you're getting all bombarded from Kramer on CNN, and you just don't know where to go. Um, uh, is there any way where you can just, like, settle your mind down to where you can just go to um, uh, one area and um, take information? I don't know if you understood no, what I No, I understand exactly what you're saying. You're right. It, it's overwhelming, and it's completely unnecessary. Wise well, trade and wise trade TV. No, no. <laughs> yeah. no, 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 what I'm saying is, is, is that... Is that pick whatever edge you're going to trade, and 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 do not expose yourself to all the extraneous information surrounding it. It isn't necessary. The edge is either going to work or it's not. It, and if it's a good edge, it's going to work a higher percentage of time that it's not. And all the other information that you think that you need is not necessary. Yes. And when I say don't think, I'm not saying don't think about the risk. Don't don't think. In other words, I'm saying yes. Think about what, what, how much it's going to cost to find out that trade's going to work. Think about a profit, you know, a way to take profits. But as far as the relationship about what you need to think about when that edge appears is that there's nothing to think about. There's nothing to consider. There's nothing to evaluate. There's nothing to analyze. Some of the most successful, I, I'm going to chime in here, some of the most successful <laughs> traders that I found were very, very simple and straightforward to the point. They had one tool. They acted on it, period, right. the end. right. All the guys that aren't making money, I, I, I can tell you that I remember specifically, there was this one guy, I'm not going to mention any names, I'd walk into his office, he had Bloomberg, bar charts, right. Right. all these 15 million screens going on, he's analyzing, picking, I see him in all this. And the guy's driving around a 1982 Honda, and this is 1998, he's got a 1982 Honda, and he, you know, he, and, and what you drive doesn't mean anything about, you know, what kind of money you're making, but the guy just couldn't make a buck. Right. And he would commit all of his money towards these these types of tools that cost thousands of dollars a month right. and just couldn't make a decision because it was just an overload for him. Well, right. and I know that um, a lot of people that are new to Wise Trade and watching Wise Trade TV, I mean, we talk, you know, a little bit about, you know, be aware if the stock you're about to trade has some news story on it that could affect if it's earnings or, you know, some big drug announcement. But for the most part, keep it simple. Yeah. Can I interrupt you just for a second, Sue, because what you're bringing up is really important. What you do is you take that news story and factor it into how much you're going to risk. Right. Factor it into to where you set your stop. Exactly. Very good. Yeah. Okay. We have another caller. It's Molly in California. Good morning, Molly. Good morning, Hi, Susan, Molly. Jared, Mark. Good morning. What um, question do you have for us? Okay. Well, first I want to tell you thank you to Wise Drink TV for bringing Mark on the show because it's, like, really helped me a lot. Um, my question has to do with what he was first talking about. Um, are you there? No, we're, 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 we're Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry no, I was looking at the TV. I'm so sorry. Um, okay, he was talking about what a pro sees. He, he said a pro sees his entry. If you could just go back over just what else the pro does. After he sees his entry, what does he do? I, I got the part where you said he has a money plan. But what else does he do? He acts immediately. Yeah, yeah there's, there's, no, really, it's pretty simple. When, when, a, when, when a professional trader, when his edge appears, he doesn't think about whether the edge is going to work or not. But what he does think about is how much is it going to cost him to find out if the trade is going to work. In other words, he assesses the risk, puts the appropriate stops in the market, and develops a plan for how he's going to take his profits if the, market, if the trade goes in his favor. Does that, does that help? Sure. You're saying okay. he actually goes in, puts his stops in place, 
And not then, all pros put their stops in place, by the way. That, there are people, you know, for example, I often don't put stops in the market. I just wait for the market to, to come to my price, and I just get out. I don't. I don't. I don't. I just don't have to put it because I know I'm not going to violate that principle. That's a personality. That's just issue. a. Per, that, yeah. Well, that's me. In other words, I know there's no possible way I'm going to violate the issue. So sometimes I'll put a stop in the market. Sometimes I won't. But oftentimes I don't. It doesn't matter. If I'm if I'm sitting at the screen, I won't bother doing it. But if you're I'm the leave, disciplined trader. Well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you, know. you can do that. You really are like the disciplined trader. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, literally. Literally, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, we have a good email from Bruce, and it says, a wonderful show. I find myself making a few trades successfully, and then I have a larger losing trade. Sometimes it is caused by a sudden market move on the opening, which I am hoping that that market will come down to my entry or even worse, where I had my original stop loss. This has been very disappointing over the years. My wife and friends think I'm the most intelligent investor, and yet I've never had a profitable year trading, and I've been trading and trying to learn how to be profitable for over 30 years. Please help, and yes, I'll do anything. Yes, I'll do it. You know what? I'm going to I'm gonna have to read that. Okay. I'm, gonna have to, I'm not sure if I followed all of it, so... One of one of the uh, tools or one of the techniques that I recommend, um, if you've if you've had oh, okay. a series of a series of wins and yeah, taking yeah, losses, right, right. is to take your wins you've had in your paper trading account. Let's just say you're very consistent at making a dollar, and don't let your losers exceed what you've the maximum that you've been winning. Go ahead, Mark. Okay, first of all, to to address this email, I find myself making a few trades successfully, and then I have a, a, a larger losing trade. Sometimes it's caused by sudden market move on the opening, right. which I'm hoping that the market will come down. Okay. Now, first of all, there's something we, we, we didn't have time to address, and we really don't even have a lot of time to do it now, but I'm, I'm going to bring it up. And that's, and that's consistency just isn't a function of learning how to think in probabilities. In other words, it isn't learning you know, to, to train your mind to, to understand and believe that there's a random outcome to these consistent patterns. There's, there's also other, other factors involved, and that's, and that's what I call uh, self-sabotaging beliefs, where you know, not everyone, not, no, we'll say not everyone we, we don't grow up with this unlimited capacity of self, self-valuation. In other words, how much money am I really worth? Or, 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 or the, and, and, and what can end up happening is that there could be a self-valuation issue. So in other words, if we, if we end up making money as a trading, we might not feel we deserve the money for some reason, and then make a trading error, which in this case he's saying, on the opening, which I then hope the market, okay? He shouldn't be hoping anything. He should, be, he should, have, his, he should have his risk already predefined and in the market, and the market either conforms to the pattern or not. But the thing is, is that it isn't just a matter of self-valuation. There are a lot of things we learn uh, when we grow up that are that are completely inconsistent with or in conflict with making money as a trader, and if we're not and if we're not um, aware that that these other mental components can come into play, in other words, like for an example, there are traders that um, I've worked with who have really strong religious beliefs that even though they might not consciously remember when they're, when they're in their middle ages, let's in their middle age, that they were taught that you know. Uh, uh, anything that even remotely uh, looks like gambling is 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 bad and evil. Okay, right. and here they're attracted to trading, and then they learned when they were kids that you know that that making certain or making money where you're not providing a service for somebody. Okay, in other words, you know where you're not providing uh, providing some sort of service. A commodity. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Where trading is basically you know you're going in the market and just making money based on your assessment to determine whether the market is going to go up or down. That that money isn't made legitimately, therefore not deserved, and so we are susceptible to making a trading error that gives it back. And so what subconsciously, we, yeah, subconsciously, right. So what ended up? So what we also have to do is we have to learn how to, to be consistent. Learn how to identify when these kind of these, these kind of self sabotaging beliefs are acting on our consciousness, causing us to compel us to make a trading error. Mm -hmm. And if we're not trading in a consistent manner in the first place, it's almost going to be impossible to recognize this. You, you see, you see the connection here. It'd be impossible to recognize that it isn't my methodology that's causing me a problem anymore. It's the fact that I'm making these errors because I have these self-sabotaging beliefs. Absolutely. Well, you know, Mark, uh, we just have a few more minutes, and I have to read this one email if you'll allow me. This is from Pip Pip Perret, uh, Carrie in Canada. And she says, good morning. I just had to send a note to say thank you very much to Mr. Douglas. I just finished trading in the zone last night, and I'm totally overwhelmed. I have learned so much. I am having difficulty putting into words how much I have gained from investing the time to truly study his book. 
I was challenged in many areas of my life. As Mr. Douglas shared his unique insight, it shined a light on several areas I was struggling with fear. This book has started a process that I sense will change my life. I am now excited about trying new things, letting go of, of discouragements, and switching negative energy to positive energy thoughts about the past experiences that were choking my ability to move forward. I know it will take me time to apply this to my trading, but I'm actually excited, not petrified. I want to encourage anyone who is considering purchasing the book or the training set. The amount of information, the life lessons, and the passion with which it is presented has the potential to bring on transformation. Mr. Douglas, wow. thank you what a nice for email. offering a training that has brought about revelation <laughs> well, in my life. God bless you. Thanks for doing this program today. We are so fortunate to you and WTV for providing this valuable training. Pip, wow. pip, hooray. Thank you very much for that email. Yeah. I would like to have a copy of that. You may have this <laughs> wow. one. Wow, thank you. That's very so, nice. So, you know, it is really powerful. Yeah. And, you know, Mark and, and Jared, you guys are have been trading in, in the deepest of the, of the trading pits, and you know how hard it can be to get your mindset right. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, That's Susan. absolutely great. Thank you very great. much. Well, guys.